I, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Georgia Gould. I'm the leader of Camden Council, and you are all, if you didn't realize this, in the beautiful borough of Camden. So very, very happy to, to welcome you to the afternoon session. And I think it's been a really uh, brilliant day already with so much rich discussion. Um, and I'm really delighted to be joined by Mariana Matsukato, who is a Camden resident, um, but most importantly is um, the professor in the economics of innovation and public value at UCL in Camden and the founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. And I think I could literally uh, fill the whole 45 minutes with going through Mariana's awards and books and, uh, and, yeah. and various <laughs> roles. I was just saying to her, I don't know how she does it. Um, but I think it's safe to say she has really challenged and changed economic orthodoxies and, and changed the economic debate. So there is a, so it's taken much more seriously the role that the state can play in creating value, in um, innovation, in entrepreneurialism. And her work on uh, using missions to solve complex challenges has inspired governments uh, around the world. It's inspired us in Camden. Mariana and I have worked together on taking a missions-based approach to, to solve challenges, inspired the Mayor of London, and now it's inspired the National Labour Party uh, to take a missions-based approach. And I think what's, what's really important about Mariana's work is she's not just an academic producing books, but she is somebody who grapples with real-world problems uh, and works with, with governments from Barbados to, to Sweden uh, to really implement them. And to work with Marianne is to, to find that she's just kind of met with the Pope or the UN General Secretary, but also that she'll sit down with our procurement team in Camden and do a workshop on how these ideas will really change things in practice on a local level and a national level. Um, so we're really excited about the way that uh, her ideas are already changing things. And I hope that the uh, Labour government will be the, the first truly uh, missions-based government to, to kind of pioneer this approach. And I don't think there's anybody better to help us think through how to do that than Mariana. And I think you're just going to start by reflecting a, a little bit about the, yeah. the approach and what we can learn from, from a missions-based approach. Yeah. Oh, good. I forgot we had microphones. I was waiting for you to hand me something. Um, so it's great to be here. Thank you for coming on a, on a Saturday to uh, listen to our joint rant. Um, we've been working together, and it's been truly inspirational. You mentioned Barbados, another absolutely inspirational leader who's the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley. I find that whether it's Prime Ministers of countries, whether it's mayors, whether it's governors, it's so interesting to learn on the ground the, the, the exceptional things that are going and, on, and by exceptional I mean an exception <laughs> to the rule, because the rule currently is problematic. So the way that we are going after economic growth, which has not just a rate but a direction, has produced an absolutely wrong direction of growth. So in this country, for example, we have growth that has led to an unsustainable uh, form of growth in terms of pollution, in terms of climate issues. It's a form of growth that has increased inequality. It's a form of growth that has increased private debt. Everyone obsesses about public debt, but the ratio in the UK of private debt to disposable income is back to the level it was just before the financial crisis. And that's what caused the financial crisis. You would think this would be on the front pages of all the papers. You would think the Labour Party would be talking about it. I promise I won't criticize you guys. Um, unfortunately, it's in the background. People aren't talking about it. And why is that? If you just create money, if you just create debt, if you just create help to buy schemes, so people buy homes, right, without their real wages going up <laughs> in the last 30 years, it's not surprising that debt to disposable income goes up. So the work that we've been doing together, and again, it's been absolutely inspirational to work with Georgia Gould, who I hope will be prime minister one day, um, is all about how do we actually redirect growth. This is not about no growth. I was joking before that no growth is for le bobo, la bourgeoisie bohème. <laughs> Sorry, a bit of French this morning. Um, this is about radically transforming how we grow. It's also radical transformation of the narrative and the stories we tell of where growth comes from, who the value creators are, who the wealth creators are. How can it be that Goldman Sachs, the head of Goldman Sachs right after the financial crisis, 
had the nerve to say Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. And he wasn't saying it to make people laugh. This was like after receiving a 10 billion bailout from the US government right after the financial crisis. He was right. How we measure productivity, okay, is actually a tautology. If you get paid a lot, <laughs> you are more productive because we have actually been confusing price with value and how we even measure growth. So how we measure growth has to change, how we redirect growth has to change, and the point of missions, the mission-oriented approach, is to say, what if we completely flipped it? That instead of talking about growth for growth's sake, we actually tried to tackle the most difficult problems of our time and got government to change how it thinks about its own role, not just fixing market failures, which is an economic speak, tries to sound smart, but actively shaping and co-creating the economy. We change how the private sector works, not just maximizing shareholder value and engaging in these massive share buyback schemes that we've seen in the last 10 years where over $7 trillion have been used by the top companies in the world just to buy back their shares, to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay, and change how they work together, also along civil society organization, or organizations actually solve really, really difficult challenges, whether it's the digital divide, whether it's net neutral, sorry, carbon neutral cities, whether it's specific challenges in cities, think of the knife crime problem uh, in London, and actually truly put these problems at the center, not at the periphery of how public and private work together. For example, even how we design an industrial strategy. And on the industrial strategy, think of the old kind of industrial strategy including laborers and the Tories, this has been equally problematic, where we just have a list of sectors that we say, oh, they're important for growth. Finance, aerospace, automotive, life sciences, the creative industry. And then we start giving money to them. We have a life sciences strategy. What if you say, forget the sectors. Of course those sectors are important, and many other sectors are important too. But we actually have a challenge-oriented strategy and turn those challenges into missions and moonshots where all those sectors and more have to work together to solve the problem. So that's how we got to the moon. 50 years ago, uh, 51 years ago, the moon landing was actually through a, a specifically organized program where many different sectors had to work together to solve a problem that was really hard, getting to the moon and back in a short amount of time. To do that, it required innovation, investment in areas as different as aerospace, nutrition, materials, electronics. There was a thousand homework problems that had to be solved along the way. Government directed it, government came up with the mission, and the new missions of the future have to be co-created, but let's just pause a bit. Government directed it, but then designed its instruments from procurement to grants and loans to foster bottom-up innovation to solve the problems. So we ended up with camera phones, foil blankets, um, uh, a baby formula, software, were solutions to problems, okay? NASA was so confident about its role, unlike today's public sector, which talks about being business friendly and, that's, and then gets, uh, am I allowed to say, screwed along the way? Uh, so socializing risk, privatizing rewards. They were so confident of their role that they put into the contracts with the private sector no excess profits. Not no profits, because you don't get to the moon with philanthropy, but no excess profits. In other words, this is going to be truly collaborative. Uh, we're going to design our tools like procurement, which you mentioned that we're working on together, to be outcomes oriented, so really bold on what the problem is and use procurement to funnel bottom-up solutions towards it. And business played the game. Now, in so our social problems, right? So in our military industrial problems, we somehow get it right. Why? Because we want to win wars. Just look at what happens now with the Ukraine war where money comes out of literally the woodwork. So Germany, after saying they had no money, create 190 billion for the Ukraine war. In wars, we always, and I don't like war, but it's interesting to see what we do in wars, we end up using outcomes-oriented tools. In wars, the military never actually just says, oh, let's just give money to the pharmaceutical companies um, and then let them set whatever price or organize intellectual property rights in whatever way. Why? Because soldiers get sick on the battlefield. So if the military is helping and working with the pharmaceutical companies to come up with drugs for the battlefield, they make sure that they have access to those drugs for the soldiers. They make sure that the intellectual property rights are designed in such a way that are not extractive. So what's, what's interesting 
is that when it's social problems, right, whether it's health, education, public transport, we just somehow get into this really lazy mode that we think we can just talk about things like public-private partnerships or PFI schemes, put some public money in, put some private money in, and then hope for the best, literally like pray, as opposed to having an outcomes orientation. So the mission-oriented uh, framing, which I think labor's starting to think about, but I think what we should talk about now is how to actually do it for real, is all about saying, what are the really difficult challenges out there? Turn them into moonshots that require lots of different sectors to work together. Get government confident enough <laughs> to actually be in the room and to strike the right deal, a symbiotic deal, not a parasitic predator-prey deal with the private sector, and work together in an all-of-government approach, not a sectoral approach, whether it's in industry or in government, right? Because well-being is not just for health. Climate is not just for the Department of Energy. Have an all-of-government approach, a confident approach, using outcomes-oriented tools like procurement, grants, loans, that funnel in bottom-up solutions from the private sector and public institutions, but that's outcomes-oriented. And to do that, though, you need a new social contract. I've been working with the um, uh, Secretary of Commerce in the US, Gina Raimondo, around the CHIPS Act, which is, you know, could just become another useless tool that just gives a lot of money out to the private sector. So it's 400 billion that's being given to the semiconductor companies to produce sovereignty of chips in the US, because they found that they were completely reliant on Asian, Asian uh, chip uh, makers. But this time around, unlike with the digital revolution where there was a lot of problems that we're seeing today with the big tech community, they're putting conditionality okay, into the contracts. For example, the companies benefiting from the CHIPS Act cannot just use the money to buy back their shares or give them out as dividend payouts. Um, the workers working in the semiconductor companies need to be earning their living wage. We need to be using those profits that are generated collectively to improve working conditions. Uh, they're putting in different uh, clauses around energy efficiency. We're trying to force that in a bit more in terms of green procurement, for example. But so that can be done. It's, it's, it's not that hard. And what's striking in the UK is it just often is not done. And even in the past, at least, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, the, the new wave of labor leaders get this right. Even the Labor Party got it wrong. This idea of being business friendly ended up creating these partnerships, which we know led to very problematic ecosystems, right? The word ecosystem is not ne necessarily a good thing. It's just saying there's an ecosystem. Is it symbiotic? Is it mutualistic? Is it parasitic? And so, for example, in COVID in this country, we helped companies which needed help because there was you know, lockdowns and planes weren't flying and so on, but we just gave out money for free. So EasyJet got 600 million in a bailout, no conditions attached. In France, Air France and Renault got similar help, but the condition was you have to commit to reducing your carbon emissions. Uh, in other countries, they said com uh, companies that are using tax havens are not allowed <laughs> just to get government handouts, right? You need to commit to changing those very problematic, dysfunctional, parasitic practices. So this is what I think the real challenge is today. How can labor, A, get just as ambitious about wealth creation as wealth redistribution, create value in a way that's ex ante, in a pre-distributive way, the right way in terms of the relationships, both in terms of capital labor relationships and public-private relationships, and to do that, to use both those outcomes-oriented tools, like outcomes-oriented industrial strategy and procurement, but to really, and this is because I think it's the pain point, change the public-private relationship so that it actually is about, and conditionality sounds like a, a stick, but still, a contract, a real deal, where we don't earn excess profits like Centrica last year, earning excess profits on the back of a huge cost of living crisis and using, again, half of it to uh, buy back their own shares, but to really forge that deal which um, is, is truly about building forwards better in terms of how we do capitalism. And I don't hear enough, I think, of this in the current discussions, and I just think it'd be really interesting also to hear from your experience in terms of what it looks like to work with business in a symbiotic way and what are the metrics 
that we can have. So it's not just storytelling, a case here, a case there, but that we can hold ourselves accountable. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you for that. Incredibly wide-ranging introduction. And I think for you know, people increasingly talking about a, a missions-based way of working, but it is it's new in our political system because I think we're used to uh, political parties setting kind of pledges that they can deliver um, and kind of very focused on the, 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 what, that, what, what government can deliver. But um, a mission is an ambitious um, goal that needs a completely different partnership approach. And I think here we started to talk about you know, long-term um, complex challenges and, and how we, we bring together the kind of energy of, of, of citizens and private sector uh, communities to, to solve those, those challenges. And you work globally on, mm -hmm. on this. I said I wanted uh, a Labour government to, to lead the world in this. But what do you think that we um, in the Labour Party can learn from what the, the, the actions other countries are taking around missions and sure. what they're doing with you. So first of all, countries that talk about growth and obsess about growth, interestingly, hardly ever achieve growth. <laughs> um, so same thing with productivity. We know there's a productivity challenge we, in this we, country. We are definitely can attest to that in Britain at the moment. Well, there yeah. is a growth challenge in Britain, exactly. but if you obsess about it, you don't get it. Um, what you need to think about is what are the, again, problems and how do you galvanize that cross-sectoral investment reinvestment, not value extraction, but value creation, getting profits to be reinvested in the real economy instead of financialized. 80% of finance in this country, in the UK, uh, goes back to finance. Finance, insurance, and real estate. Fire. <laughs> okay, the country's on fire, not just in terms of you know, global uh, climate issues, but also literally in terms of financialization. So first of all, this is a very UK and Anglo-Saxon based problem. It's, it's not true that every country is equally kind of messed up. Uh, there's really interesting lessons to learn, as we know, even you know, from Scandinavia, for example, their notion of stakeholder value where you know, trade unions are on the boards of companies, which means that you truly have that kind of co-creation from the start. It's not just about making sure workers get a benefit at the end. Workers are at the table in the beginning. As, as, as someone just told me the other day, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think what's interesting around the world is you know, a country like Sweden not only has stakeholder capitalism in terms of um, uh, uh, corporate governance, but they really took on this challenge-oriented approach. We actually worked with the previous administration on it through Vanova, the innovation agency. So they began with a really interesting challenge at the top of the government's agenda, which was a fossil-free welfare state. Interesting, eh? because you take the welfare state, which sometimes is just seen as about redistribution, so public health, public education, public transport, and you turn it into an innovation lever. You transform everything the government does through its welfare state to become fossil free. So what did that mean? It then came down into the really concrete things like school meals. School meals in Sweden have to be healthy, tasty, and sustainable, not just IKEA meatballs. Uh, and so what does that mean? That the way you procure in the food across the whole supply chain of food production into schools, right, for school lunch, which is the biggest restaurant chain in the world, if you just look at how much money the world spends on school lunches and state schools, um, into an innovation lever. So, you know, Marcus Rashford for me is a hero, even though I'm an Arsenal supporter, so I shouldn't, don't tell my kids I'm talking about Marcus Rashford. Anyway, uh, because, because of what he's done for really raising the awareness of free school meals, and it's great that you guys have that pledge towards that, but how do we transform something that we know is important into being a lever for change, for transformation that can also increase productivity? Why? Because as soon as you have a clear outcome, not just school lunch, remember when Reagan used to say ketchup is a vegetable, because uh, he wanted to reduce the money on school lunches and people had t-shirts with Reagan and ketchup and it said, which is the vegetable. Um, anyway, you guys are too young or not. <laughs> um, no one knows what I'm talking about. But anyway, so how can you use that kind of outcomes orientation, not just to the moon and back in a short amount of time, requiring all that different you know, innovation that I talked about, camera phones, folio blankets, baby formula software along the way to the moon, but just normalize that. Everything that government does should be ambitious innovative, good for people and planet, and then use the design of everything, in this case procurement, to 
transform the industrial landscape so that it requires innovation and not just kind of value extraction. Another, and, and by the way, the cool thing there is also with school meals is you can get kids involved. All of a sudden, they can also help design something that is good for them and that is transforming the supply chain, but they themselves can participate. It can go through their curriculum because lunch, you know, food is, can go across biology, mathematics, literature. Um, another example would be in, in Germany recently. I was just there with, like, literally two days ago. Um, what they've done is they have their Energiewende uh, uh, mission which is, was about getting, uh, I mean, none of these policies are perfect, by the way. It can be looked at, you know, pros and cons. But anyway, they were very ambitious around the energy policy in Germany to transform the country from being reliant on nuclear. And what it meant then was that the institutional design, because that's the other thing, what does this mean for the institutions on the ground, had to change of things like their public bank. So labor and the Tories actually every now and then talk about public banks and we need new public uh, funds, but they can also be part of the problem. I'm from Italy. I know I sound American. I promise I'm Italian. Um, Italy has a public bank, the Casa Depositi e Prestiti. See, I sound Italian. Um, but it's just been giving out money historically to companies that are like, help, help, we need money. It's like, yeah, why do you need help? What have you done recently, right? Um, Germany. Germany, because it became ambitious around its um, energy strategy, changed how the loans were being given to sectors like steel, which globally, including here, are saying, help, help. And they said, all right, we'll help you. But guess what? It depends. You need to become part of the solution, not part of the problem. What is the steel sector going to do in terms of lowering its material content of production, so it's more, less carbon heavy, in order to merit a government loan? So the government didn't tell it what to do, because that would be top-down micromanaging, it would kill innovation, but the direction and the standard, the condition was there, so the sector had to innovate, had to invest, had to retrain its workers, right? Today they have the greenest steel in the world because they had to, not because they went to Davos to blah, 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 they had to uh, 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 lower the material content of production, which they did through repurpose, reuse, recycle technology through the whole supply chain. Um, and so it, it's, this is the transformation, right? And again, whether it's loans, whether it's procurement, and the other thing is how do we make sure that the growth that then is produced by green steel, they have the greenest steel in the world today uh, alongside Sweden, the growth, so the profits that are generated are also socialized. What do I mean by socialized? Not socialism, even though we could talk about socialism, but this is the big question too. It's not about, oh, labor, we're not about nationalization, and we're not about privatization, we're somewhere in the middle. What exactly do you mean? <laughs> How do you govern a process so that you're socializing both risks and rewards? So, you know, there's a lot of mistakes made on this front. Um, Obama, after, sorry, I keep talking, at some point you'll interrupt, right? <laughs> I think everyone's point. listening as okay, well. Yeah. Sorry. I promise I'll shut up yeah. in a minute. I don't even know what time it is. Um, so what was really interesting, when we did austerity here, like which was so bad, right? So many of the ills we have today are because we underfinanced, we introduced austerity, we cut the budgets of all the things that are critical for our social fabric. This was after the financial crisis, which as I said was caused by private debt, <laughs> and we blamed public debt, and then just engaged in this completely idiotic austerity wave. Um, and also idiotic from the growth perspective, not just because it harmed people <laughs> and planet. Um, in America, there's this untold story. They didn't do that. Like Obama had a serious stimulus program. It could have been bigger. It was $800 billion after the financial crisis because they realized that to get back on their feet, austerity was not the way to go. And they decided to direct that stimulus program in a green direction. So, so far, so good. They didn't do austerity and they decided to have it be green. And the next great thing is because it was ambitious, they were able to attract top people into government. You don't have to pay people a million dollars to go into government like they do in Singapore. You know, it makes it quite attractive to work in government, but that's very difficult for many countries. They were able to attract Nobel Prize winning people <laughs> in terms of the quality because they were very mission oriented. So Steve Chu, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, agreed to be Obama's uh, head of their director of energy, uh, of, sorry, of the energy uh, agency, the director of uh, the DOE, um, not because they said, oh, come in and help us do a market failure or design some sort of tax incentive or be business friendly with the Elon Musks of the world and to de-risk and enable and all that kind of boring word we use 
in government when we talk to the private sector, but it was like, help us steer this 800 billion stimulus program in a green direction. He's like, I'm there, left Stanford, went to direct the DOE, the Department of Energy. Next thing, they set up ARPA-E. Great, it's what everyone here is talking about too little, too late through the ADIA program, right? Because DARPA in the US was a key agency in the Department of Defense, innovation agency, which got us the internet and a lot of the things in our iPhones. Today they said, okay, we need an equivalent, ambitious organization that gets us green innovation. Great, set up ARPA-E, ARPA for energy. Uh, attract a top guy to run it, Arun Majumdar, who later runs Google's energy program. Next, we're gonna have a, a guaranteed loan program to the top renewable companies, right? So, so far, so good, it's sounding great. Like, yeah, awesome, keep going. Um, so then they do guaranteed loans to companies like Tesla, interesting, 465 million to the Tesla S car. This is early days, right? Now Tesla earns a lot of money, so it might not seem like a lot. This is the high risk, early stage of Tesla success. Same amount of money goes to some solar companies like Solyndra, which go bankrupt. Right? This is where the mistake starts to come. A, no narrative. So when Solyndra goes bust, government's like, Oof, we're gonna be in trouble now, right? People are gonna start blaming us. So uh, it became a huge thing about the Solyndra loss as a typical example of government picking winners, not knowing what it's doing. Um, you know, oh, government should stop doing that. It should just set the rules of the game and stop kind of helping to direct the economy. Very little narrative came out of the Obama administration at that point to say, yeah, whatever, failed on Solyndra, but guess what? We succeeded on Tesla. You know, give us a break. We're an investor first resort. We're doing you know, hard things. Europe's there, just doing austerity. We're helping to steer economy. Second big mistake, how they structured that portfolio. It made no sense. Even though they had all these Goldman Sachs guys in government, which is a problem, those guys did not help, and it was mainly guys in the government to structure this properly. They said to Tesla, to Elon Musk, if you don't pay back the loan, we want three million shares in your company. So why would you want three million companies, uh, sorry, three million shares in a company that doesn't pay back its loan? It makes no sense, right? What they should have said is, here's a loan to Tesla, to Solyndra, to all these you know, high risk companies. Why are they high risk? Because it was the early stage of that kind of renewable wave in terms of um, uh, electric cars and so on. Had they said, in an investor first resort, market shaping, not market fixing kind of mindset. If you pay back the loan, we get three million shares in your company. The price per share went from nine to 90, right? Um, and that difference multiplied by three million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss, which everyone still talks about today as a massive government failure, and the next round of investment. So details matter, confidence matters. The fact that NASA, as I said, was confident when it worked with business, because it said no excess profits. This was an example of lack of confidence, lack of structure, lack of attention to the detail that yes, you need to help direct an economy, stimulate bottom-up innovation in the private sector, but also don't just cover the downside, right? Get a share of the upside. And there's different ways to do that. It's not just equity stakes. I mean, this was their idea, by the way. It's not me telling them that they should have three million shares. They wanted three million shares. They just structured it wrong, like here, where we you know, bail out the bad companies and they go into the public debt, as opposed to getting a share of the good that government helps create. So this also, like the conditionality piece I talked about before, is something that any progressive, progressive Britain party should be thinking about. How do we socialize both risks and rewards? Sometimes it can be through things like these equity stakes. Other times it can just be really making sure that the end outcome, right, is good for people and planet. So again, public and private working together around health, what is the actual goal that we're trying to do? You know, health for all, think of the vaccine rollout globally, it didn't happen. We ended up with eight vaccines. We wouldn't vaccinate the world. That was the goal work backwards and structure things like intellectual property rights to deliver on the goal. Structure, structure that public-private relationship to deliver on the goal. AstraZeneca, by the way, should, and the Oxford researchers, should get a Nobel Prize because they actually worked well together. They agreed to share the knowledge. They agreed to keep costs and prices low during a health pandemic, whereas Pfizer didn't. Pfizer is one of the most financialized companies in the world. So the details of public and private, how they work together, should be the centerpiece of a progressive Britain, as opposed to still using this old-fashioned words of you know, business-friendly or public and private or ecosystems. 
How are you going to ensure that the end result is not just ambitious and outcomes oriented, but the contracts, the deal, the, the kind of conditionality in the contracts is as ambitious as what we're actually trying to do. And just super lastly, growth is not a mission. Growth is the result of if you do this properly. Why? Because it requires investment, innovation, in investment in workers. That school meal example I gave, if done properly, creates growth, right, with a direction. Whereas one of the things that worries me in the labor uh, list of missions right now is that we're almost looking at the outcomes as the mission itself. And I've never seen that work. Well, but thank you so much mm. for giving us that. Oh, you go. <laughs> that international, um, international perspective, that some of the, the pitfalls and that, I think, really exciting vision of a, of a very confident, um, progressive government uh, able to capture and create value and, and shape markets. Now, we, I wanted to bring in some questions from the audience. I think, Mariana, you said that uh, for the best question, you've got a book. Oh, yeah. You've got oh. a book here. Oh. Now, as the chair, I'm going to take the best question as the one that puts, the, puts what you want to say in the fewest number of words. So that is oh. your mission for yeah. the, for the uh, Q&A. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll take three at a time, um, this gentleman. I think shout loudly, a mic might be coming. Oh, no, Matt, mic is coming. Thank you. Uh, Mariana, Georgia, thank you so much for a really insightful um, talk and a lot to think about. I have a how question and a who question. I promise you they're related. Um, in terms of metrics, how do you measure a moonshot? Uh, I mean, presumably, if we take carbon emissions, you want to sort of reduce carbon emissions by a certain amount in a but in a certain time, for instance. But then, um, who makes that decision? Mm -hmm. So when you mentioned no right. excess so profits, a line has to be drawn somewhere. So what is a profit and what is an excess profit? And yeah. who makes that decision? Brilliant. Um, uh, this, this one lady here. Hi, I'm Sabina Khan. It's really interesting to hear your perspective. What I want to know is, for me, I can see it will work in a micro level, uh, mission-based objectives, but I, I think there's going to be a lot of problem with um, um, working internationally because everything is attached to, like whether it's energy, whether it's housing, whether it's um, uh, any other sectors. There's so many other stakeholders involved and right. their assets involved. How would we make sure that goal is associated with that in a, in a macro level? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brilliant, and just in the front here. Rod <coughs> Rodell, quite a short question. Tony Blair was very confident when he had his mission to reform the NHS IT. Mm -hmm. It completely failed mm -hmm. because they didn't have the competence, you know, at procurement and controlling the project. I think this has only got worse because of the cuts um, to central government, yeah. treasury, etc. How do we put that right? Because I think I think your analysis is entirely right. But, but I don't think we've got the competence to implement it. Yeah. Why don't I start with that one? Because I'm sort of obsessed with that problem. And it's why I should have brought the other book, The Big Con. I just wrote a book called The Big Con, how the consulting industry has infantilized our governments, <laughs> weakened our businesses, and warped our economies. So if you actually look at the over consultification of government and all the outsourcing of capacity and capabilities, it began with the Thatcher years. Uh, actually, the, the consulting budget went from six million to 246 million by the end of Thatcher's uh, reign, but actually increased even more under New Labour. Um, and that's not that hard to understand why. As soon as you say, no, we are for government, we don't want government just to get out of, out of the way. We're not Thatcher, we're not Reagan, we believe in government, but you don't have a theory <laughs> and a framing of public purpose and public value and why government is different from the private sector, so you also need different measures of efficiency. You can't just bring in net present value and cost-benefit analysis into government. We would have never, by the way, done the moon landing had there been a cost-benefit analysis of structured, you know, oh, sorry, calculation made on it because the risk was too high. What are the new metrics we need, right? What is the new capacity we also need within the civil service? So we've been talking a lot about this. That's why I actually set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London, the unit that works quite a bit with uh, Georgia, um, 
which is all about bringing capacity and the dynamic capabilities of the public sector back into the state, which means investing in that. And it means also investing in metrics, and this comes to one of the other questions. So it's really interesting that the BBC has a metric of public value that it holds itself accountable to, forget whether it's perfect or not, and the recent uh, BBC issues, but at least it has that. You would be surprised how few public entities have that. So with the BBC, for example, they never accepted that they're there just to fix market failures. That's what a lot of public broadcasters do. These details, again, devils in the detail, matter. So a, a public broadcaster that sees itself as just fixing a market failure will end up just doing documentaries and high quality news, because business maybe does a bit less of that. Um, the BBC was like, no, we'll do everything. We'll also do you know, soap operas and talk shows, but with different types of metrics around public value. So at the time when it was still radical, soap operas about the working class and not just the rich and famous like Dallas and Dynasty. Again, no one knows what I'm talking about. Um, but you know, like what would it look like to have, yeah, someone's close around. Uh, those kind of metrics always also holding the state accountable. And this comes to the, um, well, sorry, so, so the quick answer is we've stopped investing within, right? So it becomes a vicious cycle. If we say there's no capacity, then we outsource it. And then there's no learning by doing. There's no trial and error. And, and we end up infantilizing government. The, and this word that we used in the subtitle came from a Tory, Lord Agnew, who you'll remember on the back of seeing how much the government was spending on consultants, both for Brexit and COVID, was like, what the, mm, you know, we are, why are we consultifying government? And he said something really nice, actually. He said, civil servants should be uh, allowed to work on the crunchiest, most difficult challenges of our time and we're just outsourcing it all, so they're getting infantilized because literally they're not learning by doing because the doing is happening somewhere else, often also unaccountable. Um, in terms of the how and the who, so this is where it also, in terms of who sets the missions, the moon landing was much, much easier <laughs> than any of the challenges we have today. And don't forget the challenges we have have been signed up to by every single country, including the UK, also coming to your global question. The so-called sustainable development goals, which children in Camden, by the way, at least my children all went to Toriano, they can all sing the SDGs. Adults in this country don't, but the kids, at least in state schools in Camden, have learned about the 17 sustainable development goals. These are 17 challenges like no hunger, no poverty, uh, gender parity, and so on, that the world has signed up to since 2015, and we are simply not getting there. That's why I was in Nairobi a couple days ago with the UN Secretary General. He asked me to speak to all the heads of the UN agencies to say, why is that? And my answer is, because we don't care. We have not treated these goals as urgently as we tend to treat either wars, when we're, where we want to win the war and hence design the tools appropriately, or during COVID, when it's too little too late because millions of people are dying, all of a sudden we remember we can use outcomes-oriented procurement and so on. So again, industrial strategies, innovation policies that are mission-oriented, that bring lots of different sectors together to tackle the missions underlying those SDGs is just something we're not doing. But who sets the mission? Right? Whereas the, the moon landing was, you know, old boys network in a room decides what needs to be done, that is surely not the way that we should be doing the SDGs. And, right? So what does it mean for a city, a council, a borough, a region, or a country to bring down that decision making in a way that actually truly is co-created? So the work that we've done together in Camden around the five different missions, to me, has been incredibly inspiring because what Georgia's done and her team is they brought the missions to the local, so for example, the clean growth mission in, Cam in Camden is also nested within uh, uh, the housing estates landscape, but instead of it just being done at people, they brought people to the table, for example, resident associations, citizen assemblies, to talk about green growth and sustainability, and also to do through the think and do, but also to transform institutions like food banks, which unfortunately have risen, as we all know, because of what's happening in this country in terms of inequality, only worsened with COVID, but it was already happening, into food cooperatives, right? So bringing agency, you're not doing good at or to people, but with and bringing that dignity and self-worth and self-value through the institutional design. And that's why the whole cooperative movement is so important, but also green food cooperative, right? So I think that's the future. Like, how do we you know, uh, design missions together, but also transform those institutions so there's agency? And also coming back to the metrics of how do we make sure that this is 
good and it's not just some, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, minister who he or her, you know, designs some sort of great mission and then it's like, whatever. Um, how do we make sure that along the way we have metrics that tell us if we're going off course? And not only should those metrics be much more ambitious than cost-benefit analysis and net present value and market fixing, so the issue of dynamic spillovers that I talked about that got us to the moon, do we have metrics in the green book about dynamic spillovers? No, they're very static metrics but also citizens themselves, Sorry. in terms of that participation, can both help set the missions, but also monitor along the way of whether the missions are actually being, you know, going the right way. And that's where you have the tension that on the one hand, these should be about the long run. It can't just be short run and thinking that things are gonna happen right away. But along the way, every six months, every year, we should definitely have evaluation of, of how it's going. And that's, again, it comes back to capacity. Uh, in uh, Barcelona, I'm working with the mayor, Ada Colau, on giving citizens much more power around even understanding how data is being used. And one really cool thing they've done is to bring computer hackers into city government um, to help make sure that when data is created, right, every time we click on something, we're creating data, uh, the data is also being analyzed by the, the, the city level computer hackers to make sure that it's, there's not all this intermediation, right? So they have a data commons, but also that the benefits of that new knowledge that's being created from the data is actually being used to improve social housing, improve public transport, and so on. And, and they've done it, I mean, it's, it's too long to sort of tell the story here, but one of the first things they realized is they didn't have the capacity within the government. And just super lastly, we did a study of globally which countries that did the best uh, with COVID and also focusing on developing countries. Uh, it, it was countries like Ker or Kerala, the part of India, uh, Vietnam, Rwanda, and Togo, that on the back of previous crises they had experienced, like the Nipah virus, had made the conscious decision to invest within the civil service. Um, and they ended up having much more dynamic tools, for example, around the infodemic, right? We gave Deloitte in this country one million a day to do test and trace, which failed miserably, right? Uh, we ended up having a very successful vaccine rollout, why nested within a decentralized network of GP practices. Have we learned from that mistake and that success story? Are we today funding even more and rendering more dynamic a decentralized network of GP practices? Look who's on strike on the streets, the answer is no. Have we stopped giving out all these uh, contracts to the Deloitte type consulting companies that have failed miserably, not surprisingly, Deloitte had no expertise on test and trace. Uh, have we learned that lesson? No. <laughs> so learning these lessons of why it is that we have so little confidence within the civil service that we have outsourced so much of it, but also created incredibly problematic extractive con uh, uh, contracts along the way, not only with these PPE things that happen, you know, pub owners being given millions to, uh, to you know, for friends and family of, of, of government uh, uh, people, you know, that whole kind of scandal side. It's, it's not the scandals we should worry about. It's the normal, it's, it's the normalization of this outsourcing trend that for the last 40 years has decreased the capacity of the state. Learning the lessons of when that doesn't happen and how to scale up those lessons so we have a capable, dynamic, creative government working with capable, dynamic, creative business on the complex problems of our time but with concrete metrics is again something that progressive Britain should be paying attention to. Yeah, and I think it's actually fascinating that at the end of all of those billions I still have nightmares about wasted on the test and trace system, government came to, to local government yeah. and asked for help and we had the relationships with our citizens and our communities to be able to deliver a much more effective system when all the, the money had, had run out. And I think my And they didn't pay you. And they didn't pay us. And I think um, my experience of working on, on missions is Britain is one of the most centralised countries uh, in, in, the, in Europe and in the world. And, we, um, and missions have given us far more power uh, as local government because that ownership of our citizens in those, those missions mean we are able to, to, to bring in partners to really deliver alongside us as, as local government, bring in that extra capacity, start to, yeah. to shape the... The, the local market, and we've really seen transformation as a result of taking that approach. So we have to finish up, but I think that the, you know, I think this conversation could go on all day, and I think what's really exciting 
from what Mariana said, is just the potential of this approach. And we've um, you know, probably got a, a, at least a, a year to, to an election. And actually, we've, we've got missions that have been set out and how we create that public conversation, how those of us who are in power locally start to deliver on those and how we put these ideas into practice, I think is really exciting. And I hope, Mariana, you'll stay as, as part of, of, of that journey and absolutely continue this, this really amazing conversation.